He Loved Us, Encyclical Letter of Pope Francis, following. Returning to the Heart In this liquid world of ours, we need to start speaking once more about the heart and thinking about this place where every person of every class and condition creates a synthesis, where they encounter the radical source of their strengths, convictions, passions and decisions. Yet, we find ourselves immersed in societies of serial consumers who live from day to day, dominated by the hectic pace and bombarded by technology, lacking in the patience needed to engage in the processes that an interior life by its very nature requires. In contemporary, in contemporary society, people risk losing their center, the center of their very selves. Indeed, the men and women of our time often find themselves confused and torn apart, almost bereft of an inner principle that can create unity and harmony in their lives and actions. Models of behavior that sadly are now widespread exaggerate our rational technological dimension, or on the contrary, that of our instincts. No room is left for the heart. The issues raised by today's liquid society are much discussed, but this depreciation of the deep core of our humanity, the heart, has a much longer history. We find it already present in Hellenic and pre-Christian rationalism, in post-Christian idealism and in materialism in its various guises. The heart has been ignored in anthropology and the great philosophical tradition find it, finds it a foreign notion, preferring other concepts such as reason, will or freedom. The very meaning of the term is imprecise and hard to situate within our human experience. Perhaps this is due to the difficulty of treating it as a clear and distinct idea, or because it entails the question of self-understanding, where the deepest part of us is also that which is least known. Even encountering others does not necessarily prove to be a way of encountering ourselves, inasmuch as our thought patterns are dominated by an unhealthy individualism. Many people feel safer constructing their systems of thought in the more readily controllable domain of intelligence and will. The failure to make room for the heart as dis distinct from our human powers and passions viewed in isolation from one another has resulted in a stunting, in a stunting of the idea of a personal center in which love, in the end, is the one reality that can unify all the others. If we devalue the heart, we also devalue what it means to speak from the heart, to act with the heart, to cultivate and heal the heart. If we fail to appreciate the specificity of the heart, we miss the messages that the mind alone can't communicate. We miss out on the richness of our encounters with others. We miss out on poetry. We also lose track of history and our own past, since our real personal history is built with the heart. At the end of our lives, that alone will matter. It must be said, then, that we have a heart, a heart that coexists with other hearts that help to make it a thou. Since we can't develop 
this theme at length, we will take a character from one of Dostoevsky's novels, Nikolai Strav Stavrogin. Romano Guardini argues that Stavrogin is the very embodiment of evil because his chief trait is the heartlessness. Stavrogin has no heart, hence his mind is cold and empty and his body sunken in bestial sloth and sensuality. He has no heart, hence he can draw close to no one and no one can ever truly draw close to him. For only the heart creates intimacy, true closeness between two persons. Only the heart is able to welcome and offer hospitality. Intimacy is the proper activity and the domain of the heart. Stavrogin is always infinitely distant, even from himself, because a man can enter into himself only with the heart, not with the mind. It is not in a man's power to enter into his own interiority with the mind. Hence, if the heart is not alive, man remains a stranger to himself. All our actions need to be put under the political rule of the heart. In this way, our aggressiveness and obsessive desires will find rest in the greater good that the heart proposes and in the power of the heart to resist evil. The mind and the will are, are put at the service of the greater good by sensing and savoring truth rather than seeking to master them, as the sciences tend to do. The will desires the greater good that the heart recognizes, while the imagination and emotions are themselves guided by the beating of the heart. It could be said, then, that I am my heart, for my heart is what sets me apart, shapes my spiritual identity, and puts me in communion with other people. The algorithms operating in the digital world show that our thoughts and will are much more uniform than we had previously thought. They are easily predictable and thus capable of being manipulated. That is not the case with the heart. The word heart proved its value for philosophy and theology in their efforts to reach an integral synthesis. Nor can its meaning be exhausted by biology, psychology, anthropology or any other science. It is one of those primordial words that describe realities belonging to man precisely in so far as he is one whole as a corporeal spiritual person. It follows that biologists are not being more realistic when they discuss the heart since they see only one aspect of it. The whole is not less real but even more real, nor can abstract language ever acquire the same concrete and integrative meaning. The word heart evokes the inmost core of our person, and thus it enables us to understand ourselves in our integrity and not merely under one isolated aspect. This unique power of the heart also helps us to understand why, when we grasp a reality with our heart, we know it better and more fully. This inevitably leads us to the love of which the heart is capable, for the inmost core of reality is love. For Heidegger, the German philosopher, as interpreted by one contemporary thinker, philosophy does not begin with a sim simple concept or certainty, but with a shock. Thou thought must be provoked before it begins to work with concepts, or while it works with them. Without deep emotion, thought can't begin. 
The first mental image would thus be goose bumps. What first stirs one to think and question is deep emotion. Philosophy always takes place in a basic mood. In German, Stimmung. That is why the heart comes in, since it houses the states of mind and functions as a keeper of the state of mind. The heart listens in a non-metaphoric way to the silent voice of being, allowing itself to be tempered and determined by it.